we are up to F is for fideism, or fideism, I prefer fideism. It comes from the same word that we get fidelity or faithfulness from, semper fi, always faithful, loyal. Um, it basically means you won't understand until you believe. This is one of my favorite subjects. So there was this medieval concept that said that the words that we have represent concepts, and those concepts point us to uh, reality. It was like looking around a corner, that you were standing in location A, there was a mirror at location B that allowed you to see around the corner to see. It wasn't an exact representation, but it, it, um, it wasn't exacting, but you get the basic thing. Then, some people tried to level this out and make it a straight line. No, nope. what we see here, that's the thing. One A and B, straight line. And so a battle broke out between these two very diverse and polarized views. Some tried to rescue the original idea by becoming more nuanced or elaborate, and that gets really wordy and philosophical, while others tried to make it more simplistic and literalistic in their understandings. And so some tried to get out of this either or understanding by developing a very different template. And that has resulted in what we call fideism or fideism. So in the pocket dictionary of theological terms, it defines it this way. The view that matters of religious and theological truth must be accepted by faith apart from the exercise of reason. In its extreme, fideism suggests that the use of reason is misleading. Less extreme fideus suggests that reason is not so much misleading as it is simply unable to lead to truths about the nature of God and salvation. So it wants to silo religious thought or divine revelation as not, uh, you can't understand it through worldly reason or obviously scientific approach or anything like that. And so it has put these parentheses around it and bracketed out divine knowledge or religious revelation as a separate category of data that can't be critiqued or even understood by other realms. So this idea has been around for a long time, but this official form has taken on a new tenacity and confrontation and adversarial. Admittedly, the 19th century was a tough one for reasoned faith. And some of the main thinkers from that century, their influence actually came to fruition in the 20th century. A guy that I like, as you know, Paul Ricoeur calls them the masters of suspicion. It's Freud, Nietzsche, and Marx, and I would add Darwin. And so in the realms of psychology for Freud, politics for Nietzsche, economy for Marx, and biology or science for Darwin, they have had a devastating impact. And this resulted in the 20th century manifestation of the storm of doubt and denominational decline that has led to our current situation. If you just think about the last hundred years, everything from, everything from the Great Depression and the World Wars, the Civil Rights Movement, the invention of television, it led to Watergate, the Vietnam War, the Cold War, cable TV, the Lewinsky scandal, Y2K, September 11th, a lot has changed in the last 100 years. And in the midst of this, faith has tried, had to try to account for new data and then modifies the word we're using or adjust and account for this in important ways because it wasn't playing by its own rules anymore. It had to play by the rules of a different game. It was no longer a home field advantage. Faith no longer got a free pass. It wasn't given the benefit of the doubt. It had to come into the court of public opinion with its hand in its hat. His, or the, sorry. It had to come into the court of public opinion with its hat in its hand humbly and try and justify itself, not by its own means, on its own terms, but on different terms that were dictated by a different realm. Psychology asked why we did the things we did. Sociology questioned the venue in which we did them. Philosophy examined the assumptions that were behind all of this stuff in the first place. 
Science explored the means by which we did them and expanded our ability to do them. So not only had the rules of the game changed, but the game itself was different and we were playing with a disadvantage. So modern Christianity had to make a choice between fight and flight or to concede the rules of the game or to adapt and evolve and adjust. Those were the four options. So a subtle form of this showed up in fideism, which has this thing called non-overlapping magisterium. So science and reason take care of their realm and faith takes care of its area. And because they play by different language games, they can't even speak to one another, let alone critique or criticize or change. And so for some of us, we bought into this thing called correlation, that, the, that one asks the question and the other tries to provide the answers and vice versa, and that they, they should correlate. But others have wanted to distance themselves from that and say, no, they can't even talk to one another. In fact, they want to be exempt from those external critiques and not have to justify themselves in a different arena by saying you wouldn't even understood if we explained it to you. And what this has done is it has broken down our society and specifically religion into the private realm or the public sphere. And so I like to complicate that and say, no, it's not either or. There are actually four layers. There's private, there's personal, just your small circle, there's the public arena, and then there's the political by which we organize ourselves. And this is why we have to care about fideism because it is the desire to preserve the past and to stake out one's territory to protect or defend the givenness of the tradition from contemporary concerns and critiques, to not allow it to be questioned. And you can actually understand this impulse because if you look at our current beliefs and practices as the tradition, you may say, I don't even recognize them as what we have inherited from history. They've changed so much, they're barely even the same thing at all. They're not just different in degree, they're a totally different type of thing. And so the three biggest temptations of modern Christianity have been to either concede, which many have done, or to attack, which many have done, or to retreat. And so that's where we find ourselves today. If you want to read more about those three options, check out the PDF where I detail some of the ways that they manifest and express themselves. But the simple fact is we live in a time where we have to ask the question, how do we know what we know about God? And the answer varies so widely that you can end up with things that are not just incompatible, but actually unreconcilable in their differences. And so that's a conversation that I'm looking forward to having.